Good evening from New York, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Czech Center in Manhattan, and we are here again to present some of the most promising Czech minds in science, innovation, and technology. My name is uh, Miroslav Konvalina, and I will be your host tonight uh, in our virtual Czech uh, Science Cafe, New York. This program is uh, prepared together with Fulbright Czech Republic. Right now, some 10 Czechs are uh, on Fulbright programs all around uh, the United States. We hope that uh, every month we will be able to introduce at least one Czech scientist, uh, his or her most interesting achievements, as well uh, the programs uh, they are currently working on in the US. Our uh, today uh, guest is uh, Michal Foytu. Welcome, Michal. Uh, you have to. Hi, greetings from rainy Boston. So thank you. So uh, it's also raining here in New York. So we hope that everybody is home watching uh, our program. Um, uh, Michala Foytu, uh, the enthusiastic uh, biochemist uh, and uh, molecular uh, biologist, is uh, passionate about novel technologies uh, for biomedicine and cancer therapy. Uh, she studied uh, biochemistry uh, at uh, the Faculty of Science of Masaryk University in Brno. In uh, 2010, in her second year there, she joined the research group led by Associate Professor Michal Masaří. Right from the start, she focused uh, her research on nanomaterials and uh, their application in oncology. Her close collaboration with this group is still uh, going on. Uh, she received uh, a PhD in physiology and pathological uh, physiology from the Faculty of Medicine uh, of Masaryk University. Uh, during her PhD studies, uh, she spent uh, several months at the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Her research uh, there focused uh, on the application of two, 2D um, nanomaterials in cancer therapy. In the last three years, uh, she worked in the worked in the Center for Advanced uh, Functional Nanorobots in Prague. In the autumn of uh, 2019, she met Dr. Uh, Shiladitya Sengupta at the conference on nanotechnology uh, in oncology in uh, Cambridge in the United Kingdom. It was the first event dedicated to this topic uh, that was officially shielded by the European Association for Cancer Research. At the conference, uh, she discussed uh, their mutual scientific interest and the areas where they overlapped. And based on this, Michaela applied for the Fulbright Fellowship to join uh, his research group. She is currently working uh, in the Center of Engineered Therapeutics led by Dr. Sangupta. Uh, the center operates at the intersection of the Harvard Medical School, Brigham and Women's Hospital and MIT in Boston. Her work has earned her uh, several awards, including the Brno PhD Talent uh, Scholarship, the prize of the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine of Masaryk University, uh, Werner von Siemens Award, and the Fulbright Fellowship. Besides research, uh, Michaela is a very social person. She likes to meet new people uh, who are passionate about their work and to exchange ideas, insight, and opinions. As a PhD ambassador, she organized uh, several scientific events for the Central European Institute of Technology in Brno. She, is also, uh, she has also worked as a lecturer of uh, Bioscope, uh, which is the Masaryk University Science uh, Learning Center for Children and Young Adults. Michala would like to contribute to the development and expansion of uh, biotech and life science innovations in the Czech Republic. Her ambition is to bring biomedical innovation closer to the bedside of the patient and to develop system and strategies uh, that make a real impact in the clinical setting and ultimately improve people's lives. Uh, Michaela Foytu is joining us from Boston, Massachusetts, and I think it is now 
uh, right time to listen to her lecture. And if you are with us on Zoom, you can post your question to the chat. So, Michala, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you all of you for joining us today for, for my lecture and for my talk. And especially in the beginning, let me thank to the whole team of Czech Center in New York and Fulbright Czech Republic for giving me this opportunity to present for you my uh, work today, the projects I'm working on with my colleagues, and especially to connect with the Czech com community here in the United States in this way. So in the beginning, let me uh, start with a question I get a lot. And probably you are also wondering about, and that's probably why you also joined this session. So why is cancer still an issue, right? Why after all these, all these years of research with all these technological advancements we have, why still cancer remains a threat? So today I try to shed a more light on this topic for you. Uh, according to the American Cancer uh, Society, one in two men in the United States develop cancer during their life. In women, it's around 40%. And one in five people die because of cancer. So cancer remains a threat to us, to people we care about. Let me stress out that today I will definitely not cover all the aspects of cancer research, but in case you have any question, feel free to drop it down in the chat box, as, as Mr. Konvalina said, and I will be very happy to answer them in the end, uh, in the end of my talk. Also, uh, let me stress out that the, my talk today will be given from a perspective of cancer researcher. That means that uh, oncologic surgeon would probably give another, another talk because there are another advancements, so would have the radiation, uh, radiation oncologist. But uh, all these different perspectives contribute to a mutual goal, which is cured patient. So today's talk, let me start a presentation just for a while. I hope everybody can see the screen. I need to I hope you all see the screen. I don't know how, yeah, I hope you can see. Uh, so uh, today's topic will be targeting selfish cells. So today I try to shed a bit more light onto this topic. In what aspects cancer cells are selfish and how we use these selfish features to fight it. So when it comes to cancer therapy, there are several, uh, several treatment opportunities. There is surgical, surgical treatment, Radi uh, radial therapy, hypothermia, phototherapy, and today we will uh, address three of these opportunities, and that is chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and combined therapy. But in order to start, we need to understand what is cancer and what feature it has, and why is it also so complex. So complexity of cancer arises from the complexity of human body itself. So uh, average human body is composed of 15 trillions of cells. So in order to keep this huge amount of cells uh, to keep its function, every cell needs to follow rules. It needs to know where to be. It needs to be one, what function to carry, when to carry out this function and when to stop it. So cancer cells in this way are selfish because they actually do not care about these rules, or at least some of them. They are on a mission to achieve two goals, and that is to grow and to spread. So they are using these cheating mechanisms in order to achieve this, achieve this mission. So these cheating mechanisms were summarized in 2000 and later updated in 2011 by Weinberg and Hanahan. And you have these cheating mechanisms here on these pictures. For example, one of the most profound uh, mechanism is in this green box and that is self-sufficiency and growth signals. That means that for every cell to grow, it needs to receive a signal, a permission from surrounding cells. Uh, to receive this permission, it has this, you see here on the, on the lower, left, uh, lower left, cell receptors in the surface of the membrane. So the growth factor, the permission to grow, binds to this receptor. And after this binding, 
the, the only then the cell can grow. But the cancer cell is actually self-sufficient in production of these signals. So it can grow and also replicate. We have the scheme of replication or the cell division here on the lower, lower right. You know, probably the, another of the most profound features is that cancer is just a bunch of cells that are rapidly dividing. So for every cell to divide, it needs to double the genetic information. The genetic information is encoded in the molecule of DNA. So therefore, the uh, molecule of DNA needs to be doubled. We call it process of replication. So the DNA doubles in amount, and only then the, cell, uh, uh, can, the cells can uh, divide into daughter cells. And this is what we use in, uh, in chemotherapy. Because actually, cancer cell can divide as many times as it wants, which is not typical for healthy cell. We call this that it has, it has replicative immortality. So with using chemotherapy, we try to stop this. Chemotherapy is using of any chemical compound in order to stop the growing and stop the spreading of cancer. So uh, here, uh, also, uh, I, uh, I want to imply that like, I think that the general perception of chemotherapy uh, is that it is some kind of evil compound created by researchers in the lab. It sometimes is, but also many times those are compounds that were isolated from plants. Uh, as for example, vinca alkaloids that are broadly used in the, in the clinical practice. And here I choose for you one of the most widely prescribed anti-cancer drugs, which is doxorubicin. Doxorubicin was also isolated from bacterium. It, it is called Streptomyces peruchesis. And it has this bright red color. So whenever time you see it, and I hope you will never see it, uh, you can identify it because of this red color and remember it because we will use it later. So doxorubicin is widely prescribed against several types of malignities against breast cancer, ovarian cancer, lung cancer. So what it actually does is you have here this planar structure, you see it in the gray. It intercalates into this molecule of DNA. You see it on the right side. I try to like illustrate it with these, with these red circles. So it squeezes between the molecule, uh, between the two strands of DNA and it stops the replication process. It stops the, the, the DNA to become double in the amount. So when the DNA cannot be replicated, the cell can't be divided and therefore the tumor can't grow. So this is how we stop the tumor from growing. But it might come to your mind that probably there are several side effects. You know, the most common one, which is vomiting, nausea. Also, if you ever wonder, wondered why the hairs are falling down during the chemotherapy, it's because of this because using doxorubicin or any other uh, chemotherapy, we are targeting this, this rapidly dividing cells, which are besides cancer cells, also hair follicles. But like, this is just a little price to, uh, to pay in order to cure a patient. What is the more serious side effect is that uh, as development of cardiotoxicity. So your oncologist needs to tightly control the amount of doxorubicin he is giving to you because if it exceeds some concentration, you might develop a serious cardiotoxic effect, which might lead in congestive heart failure. And this is in 60% lethal. What I want to say by this is that instead of curing oncologic patient, you are creating a patient with cardiovascular disease. So scientists were wondering like how to prevent this. So there were many cardioprotective compounds that were, that were used to cure this cardiotoxicity. Uh, but still many of these treatments with doxorubicin were, uh, were not successful. It was found, for example, that cancer cells can uh, develop resistance. So you might know antibiotic resistance. So actually this can happen also with the cancer treatment that from the start it's effective but then the cancer cell, cell starts to get used to it and it's just not effective anymore. So one of the very promising mechanism is using nanoparticles. And this is where nanotechnology meets oncology. So using of these nanocarriers or nanoparticles, we can wrap the, the toxic compound like in the package 
uh, we can we can we can pack it in this non toxic non toxic carrier. We can deliver deliver it specifically to the tumor tissue, so it acts only there. In this way, it's not affecting the healthy cells. So nanocarriers. These dimensions are uh, ranging from 20 to 200 nanometers, and they are of various origins. You can see here like the liposomic carriers, protein carriers, 2D nanomaterials, or gold, uh, gold carriers. Uh, the mo uh, most widely used one are these first liposomic carriers. These are even used uh, currently in the clinical practice. Uh, for example, now FDA approved is uh, liposomal doxorubicin, which is called um, myoset or doxil. And also, uh, you might know these liposomal carrier uh, from currently administrated vaccines, COVID vaccines, because it's just the same, but instead of the drug inside, there is this mRNA. Okay, so in this way, we are trying to diminish the side effects. But how to get the nanoparticle to the tumor, right? Right. So let me take you into the tumor. We were discussing that tumor tissue is just a bunch of cells that are rapidly dividing. As, uh, and also, as every cell that is dividing, it needs nutrients, it needs oxygen, which is found in the, in the blood. So therefore, cancer tissue is forcing your body to create more vessels inside its tissue in order to, to have like sufficient supply of, the, of these nutrients. Let's look into this into deta in detail. So here we have a detail of healthy slash cancer tissue. So on the left side, there is healthy tissue and on the right side, there is, a, there is a cancer tissue. And here in the middle, you can see the, the vessel. The walls of the vessel are created by endothelial cells. And you can see that in this healthy tissue, these cells are nicely arranged. They are densely packed. But as soon as the, uh, as the vessel reaches, reaches the tumor tissue, these endothelial cells have these like big, big spaces between each other. Because the, as, uh, as the vessel is created very, very uh, fast, the architecture is very chaotic. And this is what we are using when we are targeting nanoparticles, because through these, through this hole, through this leaky vasculature, the nanoparticles are entering the cancer tissue. This is what we call passive targeting. Also, you might notice this, this green little thing on the surface of the cell, which are the receptors we were talking about in the beginning of the talk. So these uh, receptors are receiving these uh, growth signals usually, and every type of cancer, for example, ovarian or breast cancer, they have specific specific expression or abundance of these growth or of these receptors on the surface. Uh, this is very important to us because we can use these receptors as addresses for delivering the nanoparticles. You can see here on the surface of the nanoparticle, we have this pink thing which is a ligand. So by this, we target the, the nanoparticle even with higher efficiency to the tumor tissue. We call this active targeting. So for, as I told you, for particular cancer type, there is a specific expression or abundance of these receptors on the surface. So for example, for ovarian cancer, there is typical of overexpression of folate receptor because folate, uh, the ligand of uh, uh, folate receptor is needed for the synthesis of DNA, or this HER2 uh, 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 receptor, which is very important for, for breast cancer. Because, for example, there are five subtypes of breast cancer. So, uh, and uh, these subtypes, they differ in the expression of these, of these receptors. They differ in the ex expression of three receptors, and HER2 is one of them. Why is this important and why I'm telling this is, this is why the doctor is performing a biopsy. This is why he is ripping up a piece of tissue from the tumor because he needs to ascertain the expression of these receptors of, uh, on, the surface, on the surface. And why he is doing that is because uh, according to the expression of these receptors on the surface of the cells, the, the cancer treatment differs. So in this way, he can administer you a correct treatment. He's saving your time and probably also life. But still, 
even though even though we know all of this, some of the treatments were failing, and scientists were wondering why is this. And they find find uh, out that unfortunately, cancer cells are not the only one to blame, and. Uh, now this is what we call tumor microenvironment because scientists find out that uh, it's not just cancer cell that are that are support, uh, supporting the tumor growth because cancer cells they can convert all the other components of 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 the tissue for example components of immune system like macrophages lymphocytes natural killer cells or other cells like fibroblasts to help her uh, help the cancer to grow. And there are actually several mechanisms, and I will explain you in more detail one of them, which is immune, immune evasion. Because uh, what cancer cell can do is it can act like it is invisible for your immune system. So immune system is, uh, is your uh, biggest, biggest fan. Every day, immune system is scanning through your body, is sniffing to a cell, and is trying to find a cells that don't belong there or viruses. So, after it sees it, for example, after a T cell, which is here depicted in blue as a part of immune system, sees a virus, is de it destroys the virus. But unfortunately, as I told you, cancer might seem invisible for these T cells. And how it's doing this? It's because expression of these receptors again on the surface of the tumor cell because these receptors that are on tumor cell they can interact or the receptors are depicted here in blue and red they can interact with the receptors on the surface of t cell and switch the activity of the t cell off so for you to imagine it maybe more simply it's like in harry potter you have this code of invisibility so this is the same. So just T cell can't see it. So what uh, cancer researchers found out, and this is depicted here on the right side, is this dark blue compound, which is which is antibody. These antigens that are that are switching up the function of T cell, we call it uh, immune checkpoints. And this compound that is blocking the function of these immune checkpoints uh, are called immune checkpoint inhibitors because they inhibit the function of immune checkpoint. And remember this compound uh, because we will back to it uh, go back to it later. So by using this uh, compound, we are like ripping up the invisibility code and the T cell can target and destroy the tumor again. Unfortunately, there are many of these uh, immune, uh, immune checkpoints, just for you to illustrate how complicated the problem is. But uh, even now, there are like these immune checkpoint inhibitors being used in clinical practice. And back to the nanoparticles. So now, actually, I'm finally getting to what I'm doing. So we are basically trying to uh, use these nanoformulations and optimize, uh, optimize it, its properties so as more, uh, the most effective against particular types of cancer. So we are using this, this blue nanocarrier. We are loading it with the cytostatics. In this case, I choose doxorubicin. You, you remember the red color. So we wrap it inside the package in order to stop the tumor from growing. But of course, you can use also other cyto um, cytotoxic compounds or other chemotherapy. Then we decorate the surface of the liposome with these immune checkpoint inhibitors. You remember the, the things that are ripping up the uh, invisibility code? And also you can choose uh, another compounds that are working in a synergy with, with all these compounds. So in this way, we are trying to find compounds that are the most effective uh, and try to, to balance the composition of the carrier in order to achieve highest effectivity towards tumor that are probably or that are hard to treat. Unfortunately, this is not the only mechanism uh, cancer cells are cheating, or uh, <laughs> the only uh, cheating mechanism cancer cell is using. Uh, for example, my other project is dedicated to formation of nanotubes between, uh, between cancer cell and immune cell. So this is what you can see here in this drawing. So cancer cell is the orange one, T cell, the component of immune system, is the yellow one. So what the cancer cell is practically doing is that it creates this uh, tubuli and it steals the mitochondria. 
why it won't mitochondria, why, uh, right? So mitochondria are like an energy factory of every cell, not only of cancer cell. So after cancer cell gets exhausted at its, its run out of energy, it can actually steal the mitochondria from all the other cells that are found in the tumor microenvironment. So it is not that like the other cells are helping the cancer cell actively. It's just cancer cell is doing whatever uh, it wants. Here, uh, the, the lower picture is like uh, a real picture from a microscope. This is on the left, it's cancer cell. Uh, actually, uh, this is breast cancer cell. And you can see the formation of nanotubuli with, with this uh, cytotoxic T cell. Well, uh, basically, uh, these are projects I'm working on here. So we are trying to find compounds that inhibit creation of these nanotubuli. So, so the treatment is more effective. And uh, so we were discussing the, the current treatment and like the novel approaches. And uh, now I would just uh, like to briefly introduce a future of the therapy, which are nanorobots and their, uh, their, their use in anti-cancer therapy. So actually what nanorobots are, are fancy nanoparticles that has this one extra, and, uh, extra feature, and that is that you can control its propulsion uh, or you can control the release of the payload. So they are empowered either chemically or physically, maybe by ultrasound or by a magnetic field. And to explain you this uh, more in detail, I choose this, uh, this research. Uh, here, the researchers use magnetotactic bacteria. You can see the real picture here on the, on the upper, upper left. Uh, this is magnetotactic bacteria. You can see that he, there are these like black dots and these are magnetosomes. So uh, this bacteria is, is reacting to the applied magnetic field. So what the scientists did is that uh, they use it to target therapy towards tumor. Tumor here is depicted here in the, in the uh, lower left in the green color, you can see the, the increased vasculature. And uh, you can see here the magnetotactic bacteria in blue. So what the researchers did, that they, they attach on the surface of this magnetotactic bacteria, these liposomes, these nanoparticles uh, that have this, uh, that has this like toxic payload. They are like loaded with, uh, with cytostatics and they, they use magnetic field to navigate, they, they navigate it directly into the tumor. So in this way, in the course of time, they saw a tumor size reduction. So in this way, you can control directly where the nanorobot is going in the body. And uh, you can use also some nanorobots uh, to release the payload. So after it reaches the, the, the tumor, only then the payload is released. There are many other applications in biomedicine, as for example, of besides the drug delivery, it's wound healing, it's performing of biopsies, and uh, but also nano, uh, nanorobots are not used on, uh, only in biomedicine. And then that's what I think is the uh, another talk after me in the Science Cafe, and uh, this, uh, this, this will be delivered by Professor Franciszek Stepanek because these nanorobots, they can be used also for environmental protection. So in the end, just let me stress out that whenever time you see an article in newspapers, uh, Novinki.cz, this is, this is exactly the type of media <laughs> where these, these articles are. So whenever uh, time you see an article that, for example, vitamin C is killing cancer, remember, it's not only about killing cancer cells, it's about the duration of the effect. It's about the, uh, like how the tumor environment will react. And uh, also, it's about the side effects it causes. So uh, in the end, let me thank all of the people I cooperate with. Firstly, from the Center of the Engineer, Engineer Therapeutics here uh, at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women Hospital. Then from, from uh, Michal Masajik Research Group, from Department of Physiology from uh, Mr. University, and also to the Center for Advanced Functional Nanorobots from University of Chemistry of Technology. And especially thank all of you uh, for watching this talk, and I'm really looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela. 
It was great, great presentations. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, you are so optimistic and, and you know, working with you on the research, it looks like great, but we know that it's still cancer. It's, it's uh, really deadly serious. And tell me uh, what is the first question on my mind, you know, isn't uh, the cancer research sidelined now? with um, not uh, only with COVID, but with all the problems with new normal, with the life we are living right now? I don't think so, actually. Uh, I think, like, unfortunately, cancer will still remain among us because also, like, as the uh, medical advances are here, the, the longer we live, actually, the high probability we have to, to develop cancer. So cancer will not magically disappear and also, I don't think that all people will live like uh, a, how to say it, a totally healthy life, right? Because cancer is also influ or development of cancer might be of some like genetic uh, load you you carry. It might be also, but it's also caused of development of cancer. It's also caused by the life you are living. Uh, so definitely, we will not get rid of cancer, and it will still remain a threat to all of us. Okay, you you mentioned that um, your ambition is to bring uh, biomedical innovation closer to the bedside of the patient. So, yes. what do you mean by that? So, I would like to contribute to to translating of some of these uh, nano formulation I told you about uh, to a clinical practice. So. Uh, like, for example, in Czech Republic, we have, um, I think, one of the uh, areas we are missing is uh, more, more, <clears throat> more, uh, more companies that would be focused on research and development. So uh, even though we have these uh, like pharmaceutical companies in Czech Republic, these are mostly, uh, mostly like international corporates and no R&D is actually happening there. So maybe by this, having some, I don't know, now it's very, very fashionate, but maybe some little company, I'm intentionally not saying startup because now everybody needs to have startup. Uh, so maybe like this, maybe meet here some, some uh, interesting people and deliver or, or transfer this knowledge to back to Czech Republic. And I think this is the, this is the idea of Fulbright, right? Yes. So let's go a little bit deeper. Uh, if you can look to the chat, we have two um, more serious questions. So let's start uh, with Stanley, who is uh, asking, has the rate of uh, congestive heart failure mortality more than 60% change with uh, DOX treatment over time? In other words, has the rate improved uh, over the years? Uh, well, I'm not aware of that, but, but I would say, that if you develop this congestive heart failure, the, 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 the probability of, of uh, mortality is still the same. What drops is the probability of getting this congestive heart failure, uh, as I told, by using these cardioprotective compounds or this, uh, or this nanoformulations of doxorubicin. So this is what I think that's changed. But you need to keep in mind that also uh, by wrapping this doxorbicin into this nanoparticle, you will develop different side effects. It's not that uh, the side effects disappear. So for example, for this uh, nanoformulations, there is uh, not, um, uh, the adverse effects not, uh, are not, uh, not cardiotoxicity, but uh, there are certain skin conditions that can develop. Mm -hmm. So there is another question. So my question is the nanoparticles are like soldiers who disrupt the receptors to the cancer cells? Oh, well, might be, but we use them more to target the cancer cell. Okay, so this is a whole uh, another area of cancer research, finding this specific receptor, because as soon as you find a specific receptor for, for some particular cancer type, you partially won because you can you can design a treatment and use this, as I told you, by like address this, this chemotherapy directly to a tumor. Also, this uh, expression of these receptors, by the way, is also used to not only to de determine the, the molecular subtype, but also the prognosis of, 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 your, of, your, of the disease is, is dependent on this. Mm -hmm. 
So another question, what do you think are the biggest challenges with uh, regards to targeting a payload? Well, biggest challenges. Biggest challenges are, for example, to deliver efficient amount of payloads, right? To, to, to pack the package tightly, to fill it with the payload, because uh, the, uh, the encapsulation efficiency varies among these carriers. So this is definitely one of them. Also, you need to keep in mind that these carriers need to be biocompatible and biodegradable. So uh, this is this is another ch uh, challenge, and also the release of the of the drug. So you can pack the package, you can wrap the the compound into the package. But the uh, an another uh, another thing is to release it efficiently, and sustain uh, like in a proper order, like you know to release uh, to release it uh, gradually. Uh, there is another question. What uh, knowledge do you have about this procedure uh, stated at uh, cancer.gov? Uh, the study funded uh, in part by NCI is testing a type of uh, immunotherapy in which patients' own immune cells are genetically modified to better see and kill their cancer. Yeah, uh, well, this is, I, I think you mean the CAR T therapy? Uh, well, I'm not working on this actually, but I know the basic idea. So uh, actually what um, this procedure is about, uh, that they take out your T cells out of the body, they trans uh, transfer it to a laboratory. And I mean physically, like really, for example, I know, uh, I think that from Czech Republic, they transfer it to laboratories in Germany or might even be in the US. So you might uh, imagine how expensive this therapy is. So genetically, they, they put their, uh, this uh, genetic information, so it produces this, this, uh, this ligands on the surface. So it targets, uh, targets these specific receptors. This is personalized treatment. So uh, they designed the, 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 uh, the lymphocytes specifically for your, uh, for your tumor. As I told you, like the tumors, they differ in the expression of these of these receptors on the on the tumor. So, uh, um, but I'm not working on that. Uh, uh, but it's definitely uh, a very promising strategy. But as I told uh, told you, uh, very expensive. Doctor uh, Pavel Ilner is um, asking how much uh, of this kind of research is going on in the Czech Republic. And maybe I will let, you know, yeah, we are interested, you know, how much we can do basically in small countries at the Czech Republic and, uh, you know, what was the, your biggest surprise or experience and what do you want to learn here uh, being in the United States? Uh, well, okay, many questions. Uh, many questions, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. Uh, so first thing, I need to stress out that uh, cancer uh, or the research focused on delivering of, of anti-cancer drug using nanoparticles uh, has kind of now a long tradition in Czech Republic. I know many research group, uh, group, groups that work on this topic. And uh, also, uh, another thing I need to stress out that that like the, the level of the research is very comparable to, to the research abroad. It's not like that we are just playing around in Czech Republic and all the big research is happening abroad. This is not true. And I learned this not only in Singapore, but also, also here. Like here is definitely higher level. But uh, so very great research is happening in Czech. I know research groups uh, in Brno at Mendel University, um, then in, in Prague. So I, I think what is missing in Czech Republic is this translation, you know, as I told you, um, at least I'm suffering from this <laughs> feeling that we don't have enough pharmaceutical companies like, you know, uh, for us in Czech Republic, it's it's sometimes unfortunately ends with publishing a paper, a scientific paper, and there is no, um, it's not continuing. So what I see here in Boston is that like the biotech environment here is is huge, and practically every lab uh, has some spin-off company. My boss here has three startups, you know. So here it's something totally different. Also, many of students here, for example, from the beginning of the PhD, 
they work in biotech consulting uh, they have these like biotech uh, clubs and they work in and for biotech uh, consult uh, consultancy so but practically that was not uh, something you were talking about so, so what i think is this like next step but i think czech republic has a huge potential not only geographically because we are in the middle of europe but uh, but also because of the high quality research that we are capable of doing with all these research infrastructures like satec biosef uh icrc and all these like and of course universities or uh, um um this research institute in olomos uh i don't know rc um <laughs> so yeah definitely huge potential in czech republic Great. So, uh, you know, I think uh, to comment a little bit on that, um, you know, it's uh, very important that uh, 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 you are here and other Czech scientists uh, like uh, Professor Franciszek Stepanek, you and others are in prestigious um, uh, American universities and institutes. It is the sign, you know, uh, other people can't travel like there are no <laughs> artists right now so it's important that the research is going on and that uh, the, the the research uh, continues so um, i think um, michaela it's time to for your final uh, remarks uh, if you want to add something and uh, uh, then we would like to thank you Oh, there is one more question, Ivan. Thank you for your presentation. I would like to ask you which phase of the research of the nanoparts and nanorobots is running now? How long it will take to bring the results from the last uh, testing phase to the clinical hospital environment? Yeah, so uh, nanorobot is something that is currently under development. Okay, so it's definitely not something we can now use in the in the hospital, but um, this is what is research about uh, about, right? So we now are, for example, focused on the navigation, on uh, the biocompatibility of the nanorobots, and then definitely there are still some challenges we need to solve. But uh, yeah, these might be subject of of um, Another another research, so uh, uh, definitely uh, I'm, I can't express in years, but uh, we are on a good track, definitely. Okay, so we hope that uh, you and other uh, Fulbrighters uh, here in the United States will have a chance to to come to New York and and that we can meet kind of informally. The restaurants are already open and um, uh, the Bohemian National Hall is uh, running our programs at least on the roof and downstairs in the restaurant so uh, thank you very much Michaela hopefully we can see you here in in New York and others thank you all, uh, thank all of you for joining today and if you have any other follow-up question and you don't want to to present it publicly uh, i think uh on the on the web page of czech center there are contacts uh, how to reach me out so i will be very happy to to have or to answer your question in this way uh, thank you very much so thank you uh, that was uh, czech science cafe new york today with the biochemist and molecular biologist uh, michaela foytu uh, who is here in the u.s on fulbright uh, fellowship at the harvard medical school in boston this program was not only brought to you on zoom uh, but you can watch it again indefinitely in the czech center new york facebook page uh, our virtual uh, next science cafe in new york uh, is planned for May uh, the 11th, and our guest, as already mentioned, will be Professor Franciszek Stepanek. Uh, Franciszek Stepanek is a full professor uh, at the uh, University of Chemistry and Technology Prague and uh, head of uh, robotics, uh, chemical robotics laboratory, which was established in 2008. He also serves as a scientific director at the park. Uh, he has been awarded many international and national awards for his scientific uh, work, as well as um, he is uh, famous for his efforts in popularization of uh, science. Uh, Michaela, last question, how important is uh, doing these um, uh, lectures and how important is to popularize the science? I think it's very important because, you know, um, 
Science is not only about being in the laboratory, but it's, it is also about context you create, because this is this is actually what I was talking about. This is what, what we are missing, the translation to the clinic and the translation to the clinic is happening by meeting people, not only from your bubble, not only researchers, but also, for example, investors or people from, from uh, pharmaceutical companies. So actually this is for me very important and I would like to thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you for representing uh, Czech Republic and please uh, follow uh, on our Czech Center in your programs on our web or uh, don't forget uh, that next week we will launch uh, what will be already the 10th Czech that film virtual movie festival with amazing feature films Czech TV series and documentaries. Have you seen some good Czech movie recently? <laughs> or TV series or documentary? <laughs> oh, the, the last film I saw was As uh, 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 There is Nine uh, Nietzsche. Okay. Nine Nietzsche. Uh, Nine Nietzsche. Maybe we will see later. Uh, so, uh, Nine Nietzsche. <laughs> Vlasnici. Vlasnici. Yeah, that yeah, was amazing. Like it's, after, it's, after a long time, a, perfect film. Yeah, uh, so uh, we will have charlatan, Havel, uh, uh, and uh, other uh, other movies, and there will be also uh, two TV series. One was awarded by Emmy Awards. I think Martis is that, and and then uh, there is the series actor, and uh, there will be other documentaries, so like Alchemist and and um, I, about women going up to the K2. Um, so thank you very much and uh, you see you much. soon. Um, you know, Science Cafe continues almost every month and we also have a Global Science Cafe broadcasted from London and Prague as well. Thank you very much and good night and uh, enjoy your stay in Boston. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Bye-bye.